It was graduation week. I've been seeing young people showing up in restaurants around town uh, dressed for proms. You know how they are. The uh, guys are in tuxedos that don't fit, uh, looking awkward, uh, very uncomfortable, and the girls are looking absolutely radiant, and you sit there and wonder, what in the world is that girl going out with that clod for? Uh, we've been seeing all of that for a few weeks. Finally, we've made our way to graduation week, but I was sitting in a funeral home listening to the funeral of a teenage boy. The room was, you know, full of, not full of teenagers, but half full of teenagers. The, the adults were there, the family were there, teachers were there, and, and any number of classmates had shown up at his, at his funeral as well, and they were all dabbing at their eyes and clinging to one another and crying, and it was very understandable. The youth minister of the church where he, uh, the young fellow or his family had attended was handling the funeral, and I guess they thought that they should try to be relevant to young people. So there were a lot of allusions to youth and to young people and the things that young people like, and one of the parts of the funeral was a eulogy by another young person, which was very nice. And this uh, young preacher got himself pulled a chair over and got his guitar out and sat down and played a little folk song about some meaningful thing, which I have since, long since forgotten. And the funeral sort of went on that way for a while. And finally, the preacher made a statement that I nearly fell out of my seat, nearly slid right out of the pew. He said, this young fellow now, and called him by name, he's trying, I guess, to comfort all the young people, the friends and the ones who cared about him, his girlfriend and so forth. He's up in heaven right now driving fast cars with a stereo blasting away in his ears. I thought, what an insult to the intelligence of everybody here. And I don't mean just the adults, I mean to the teens. The teens knew better than that. Anybody who thought twice would know better than that. It's as though all God had to do for teens, had nothing better for teens to do throughout all eternity, was to play. You know, I, my impression of the teens that I've talked to and I've, I've worked a little bit with and been around is that they understand the difference between play and work and that God has better things for them and better things in store them, that for them to do than, than to play for all eternity. What does God have for us to do? It was a question I kind of began to think about after that funeral. What he has for us to do is work that is more fun than play and more satisfying than you can ever imagine. Now, most of us go through our lives drawing a sharp distinction between work and play. Play is fun, and work is not. It's unfortunate. But there are people in this world who have been lucky enough to find work that for them is more fun than play. They get up in the morning thinking about it. They go off to work with great expectations. They almost dread to leave the office and go home at night because there are th more th better things to do here than there are to do at home. They love their work. They love what they do. And yes, they, they will reluctantly be forced sometimes to take a vacation from, from time to time to get away. But, but even when they're away on vacation, they're thinking about their work because their work is so much fun. There is such a thing as work that is more fun than play and is far, far more satisfying than that. That is what God has in store for us. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, for years we have been preaching about the world tomorrow. That was the name of the telecast that Mr. Armstrong, you know, conducted for so many years and the radio broadcast and I remember back in 1958, turning on my car radio and listening for those words, the world tomorrow. And then here came either Garner Ted Armstrong, most of the time, and occasionally his father, Herbert W. Armstrong, with the good news of the world tomorrow. Now, that, the good news of the world tomorrow was there, but what I heard an awful lot of was the bad news about what's got to happen between now and the world tomorrow. It was the truth. It was nothing wrong with that. But we had to come to realize that this world was not going to get better on its own, that things in this world were not good, they were getting worse, and that we were going through a time called the Great Tribulation between here and there. But the time would come when Christ would return. He would come to put an end of all of man's misrule 
and bring in the world tomorrow. Now, teenagers for years, listening to all of us preachers in the, in the church preach about all the, the nasty things to happen in the years ahead and about the return of Christ and the resurrection and the kingdom of God and so forth. And quite logically, for young people, just because they're young does not mean they don't think, quite logically had a struggle in their mind over the question of, where will I be, maybe more important for me right now, where would I want to be? Because I want to have a chance to fall in love, I want to have a chance to get married, I want to have a chance to, to have children and see my own children, There's the experiences of this world, the things of, uh, that, that people get to enjoy. I want to enjoy those things. I want to have a home, I want to have a car, I want to have a wife or a husband and children. Will I ever get to have those things? The question is, I guess, would you rather be physical or spiritual when Christ comes back to this earth? I think what you need to understand is that the early millennium is going to be a rather uncomfortable place for physical beings. It's going to be pretty uncomfortable because there are going to be some serious problems to be solved. For those who are spiritual and spirit beings at the time, there is an interesting set of problems to be solved. Now, we spend a lot of time, it seems like we've been spending more time this year than I can remember in a long time, criticizing government. What government isn't doing, what government doesn't seem to be able to do, what government can't get right, how everything government puts its hand to, government messes up. Well, there's going to come a time when we will have our chance to do better. What exactly will the challenge be? Now, most of us love games. We like card games. We like board games. We like video games. Some of us like computer games. We like to get a good adventure game, which puts graphics on the computer screen and calls for you to make decisions about various and sundry things. What I think many people don't realize is that all games represent a set of problems to be solved. A video game, uh, be it one of the cut-and-shoot type or the... Uh, you know, the old Donkey Kong climb vines and get across from here. here. All those, those games are not merely hand-eye coordination. They involve problems that you have to solve, things you have to figure out. Why, if I go down this corridor, do I die? And if I don't go down this corridor, I don't. Why, what do I need to take with me? What kind of a weapon do I need to have? What kind of protection do I need to have? And kids will sit by the hour in front of television screens solving problem after problem after problem after problem. And oddly enough, a lot of the problems that are solved that way involve the same sort of skills that you use in solving any kind of problems. They involve trial and error, logic, reasoning, and the processes that are, that are involved in it. The beginning of the world tomorrow, when Christ has returned, taken over the rulership of the world, the beginning of the world tomorrow will be the biggest game you ever played. In the sense that it will involve the solution of some of the most complex problems the world has ever seen, known, or even imagined. And there will be time to think, to plan, and to work your way through and to solve the complex problems that you solve in most of the computer games and video games that you may tackle along the way. Here's the kind of challenge. The world has just undergone an environmental disaster that puts, pales, and moves into insignificance everything that all of the doomsayers you've heard up until now have even talked about. The world will have gone through a terrible environmental disaster. The cities of the world are lying in ruins. Dead bodies are everywhere. The problems of disease are rampant. People, there are people who are there and have survived it all, are scared, frightened, right to the verge of insanity. There are people all over the place who are sick or wounded or crippled. In fact, the number of people who are whole-bodied at this point of time will be a relatively small percentage of the population that is left. There are, at that time, no jobs, no monetary system, no economy, no food, no shelter, no clothing, no way of moving material shelter and so forth from one place to the other. Now, you want a problem to be solved? You know, you could manufacture a, a video game around this idea of rebuilding the world, call it Millennium, and begin to figure out the ways in which you solve the problems created by a 
continental by worldwide disaster that happens at the end time. How about it? Do you have any ideas? Where would you start? What would you pick up first? Who would you talk to first? What steps would you take along the way? Now, the answers to these questions are important, and they're important for this very reason, that the solutions wait for you. The solutions to these problems will not, in general, there will be a few things I'm sure that God will do miraculously, but the main part of the solutions to all these problems will not be handled by divine fiat, by God saying the word. They will be solved by people like you who have not merely lived into the world tomorrow, but who are spirit beings moving into that world tomorrow, who will have the, the power, the sense, the direction, and the help of God to begin to sort out the problems. Now, what is fascinating about all this, and if you'll turn back to Isaiah chapter 59, I want to show you a little bit about what I mean. There is kind of an idea in many people's minds, and you, you've gone to church and other churches very much, you've heard the idea that you get saved in this life, you go through the waters of baptism, you come up out of the waters of baptism, and you're saved. Once saved, always saved. When you die, you're going to go to heaven, and when you go to get to heaven, there's not anything for you to do except look into the Master's face, uh, dine on milk and honey, walk on streets of gold, play on harps, uh, sing music, uh, whatever, this type of thing, and worship God for all eternity. Nothing for you particularly to do. Well, I think many people look upon the millennium as much the same way. The Christ comes back to earth, he raises the dead, and then he begins to do all these things while we stand around and clap our hands and watch what it is that he does. Never quite tumbling to the fact that one of his key parables said to a man, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in these things. Have authority over ten cities. What in the world does that mean? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know much more than just what Jesus Christ said right there. But there's a passage back here in Isaiah that gave me some clues to this one day as I was looking at it. I suddenly question in Jacob. This is talking about the Redeemer, Christ, returning from heaven to Mount Zion, which is where he is going to return when he comes back. And he is coming to a category of people, that is, though that category of people who have turned from transgression who have stopped being disobedient and have started being obedient. They have repented, in other words. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit which is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, nor out of the mouth of your seed seed, from henceforth and forever. What's he saying? He is simply saying, my word I have put in your mouth, and it's not going to, to cease being in your mouth. That is, you're not going to cease being in a position to speak my words with my authority, to carry on my work throughout this time. Then chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The prophet is revealing here a mystery which most people in the world have never understood, never grasped, never even began to deal with, that the glory of God would rise upon man. He said, Arise, which means come up, as in a resurrection. Shine! We are told that Christ's face shines like the sun in its full strength, and we are told that we are to be like him. Arise, shine, your light is come. And the glory of Jehovah is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to your light. Notice that. It didn't say the Gentiles would come to God's light. It said the Gentiles will come to your light kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They gather themselves together. They come to you. Why are they coming to you? What do they want from you? What do you have that they want, need, desire, or are trying to get? Oh, that's easy. These are people who are sick, who are hurt, who have no food, who have no clothing, have no shelter. 
They are coming for healing. They're coming for hope. They're coming for food. They're coming for those things that those people upon whom the power of God rests can do for them and for the changes that those people can make in their lives. Arise and shine, your light has come. Then he says in verse 5, you shall see and flow together, and your heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted to you, the forces of the Gentiles shall come to you. What a feeling it must be to come to a period of time when people are in desperate need of hope, desperate need of encouragement, desperate need of answers, and to know that they are coming and to know that you have what they need. The knowledge, the light, the power that you have what it takes to do what needs to be done. He says in verse 9 of chapter 61, the, your, Their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, for they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, like a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and like a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth her bud, and, 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 and the garden causes the things that are sowed in to spring forth, the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. The reason this happens is because finally a work has been done. It's talked about in chapter 61, beginning actually back in, uh, I believe, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound. Can you imagine? You're a soldier, and you have fought your way across France, well and deep into Germany and halfway across Germany, and finally one day you come upon what looks like a prison camp beyond the edge of a forest in a glade. And as you come to it, there appeared to be no one there. There are no guards, for the guards have fled. But there is movement. And when you walk inside, you see people. Well, I guess you'd call them people. They look like skeletons walking. There's hardly any skin upon their face. There's nothing but bones with barely skin upon them upon their hands. Some of them have to be carried by their friends and by their mates. They're wearing ragged old striped clothes. They take you out and show you places where some of them have been shot and buried. They show you the crematoriums where many of them have been gassed. This is talking about a time and a people who are able to go to people who have been through this to proclaim liberty to the captives, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to open the opening of prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort everyone that mourns, to appoint to them at morn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes. They'll raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolation of many generations. The world, by the time we get our chance at it, will be an absolute wreck. And there will be people who need us to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to extend a hand to people who are hurting and in pain, and to put your arms around someone whose eyes are staring off fixed in the distance and who has very nearly lost his mind because of the things that his eyes have seen just before you got there. The work of the millennium is a complete redesign and remake of the world as we know it. The world will have to be rebuilt physically in the sense of cities, and the world will have to be rebuilt socially. Swords will have to be beaten into plowshares. Spears will have to be beaten into pruning hooks. We'll have to be able to be ready to keep people out of trouble, to release captives, heal the sick, and even to raise the dead. You know, if you think of it in terms of a set of problems to be solved, it is not a game, but it is like a game in that sense. The pro you know, it, it's a sad thing in the sense that so many of the games that we play are destructive. 
even on video, the games are destructive. Now, oftentimes, these, ge these destructive games are built around the idea that we are destroying an enemy in order to save the weak. But game after game after game, as you make your way through the video malls, involves war, destruction, fighting, killing, shooting. I wonder if we will be able to adapt to a game that heals and builds. Now, there's a funny thing about games. Have you ever noticed that animals play games? They really do play games. I remember the first really awareness that I had of this type of thing where I thought about it as a game was on my grandfather's farm. Because oftentimes in the evening after the day's work was done, and everybody had, had supper and gone out, you know, waiting for the dark to come because there was no electricity on the farm in those days, and you enjoyed the daylight as long as it was there. And the cool of the evening, and there were always kittens there because on a farm like that, cats are an asset. They help keep the rodents under control, and they're really nice to have around. There were always kittens. And the kittens always played different versions of their little games. My grandfather liked to call it cowboys and Indians or just plain cowboys. And indeed, they would, you see oftentimes, in a B Saturday Western. One of them will hide around a corner and wait there, you know, and absolutely motionless, while another kitten, waiting for another kitten to walk by in front of him, who does so almost as though he's playing his own role, knowing the other one is there, but pretending he's not. And then one kitten will pounce on the other, and then they will roll over and over and over, boxing one another, fighting with one another, pretending to bite and, and claw one another. Puppies fight wars that often sometimes you think are going to rival the Battle of Britain. If you have two dogs in the house, every so often you're going to have a mock fight. It's exercise, what is what it amounts to for them. They play at it. It's how they learn, as a matter of fact. Animals practice for life. They practice for living. They practice hunting. They practice defending. They practice all the things that grown animals normally have to do in order to live. God built it in them just that way. Strange as it may sound to you, the world that we live in now is in many ways just practice. It is like a game. It isn't. It's much more serious than a game. But it's like a game in the sense that it is practice. And it's like a game in another very important sense. That those people who die in this game, like Tom and Jerry, are not really dead. They sleep. And they will live again. What may come as a surprise to you to suggest is that even the millennium may be practice. Once again, it may be a game. For to begin with, you are given a set of problems to be solved. You go to work solving the problems, and of course, in the solution of problems, as you go through the process, you learn and you develop, and your skills at problem solving become better all the way down the line because you do these things. Here's the question that occurred to me when I was thinking about this. Why didn't God start with the millennium in the first place? It's a kid's question, but it's an absolutely logical question. Why didn't he just start with the millennium in the first place? Why are we going through this exercise now with all the pain, the frustration, with Satan being here and all that he is doing? Why did he do it that way? Why didn't he start with his kingdom, his world, his government, no devil, and all this type of thing? Well, why do kittens play games fighting with one another? Why do dogs pretend to hunt? Why do, why do all these things in God's creation go on in the way that they go on? For a moment, let's pre re reprogram the computer and let's change the parameters of our, of our little game that we're playing right now. Consider for a moment the size of the universe. By now, everyone knows that the universe is an expanding universe. It's one of those scientific theories that just keeps finding more and more confirmation every time something new in the heavens is found. Some years ago, an astronomer named Hubble found that everything in the universe, no matter where he went, looked out, out in the far universe, everything in the, in, in the universe was moving away from us. And not only that, but the further away it was, the faster it was moving. The model led to the natural assumption that if everything is moving away, then if we turn time around and turn the clock backwards, then at some time in the past, everything was closer. 
And if you go back far enough, everything was in the same place at a singularity. And out of this come, came the concept of the Big Bang, where at some point in time there was a Big Bang. That's not a very good term for it. So astronomers are looking for a new word, new expression than Big Bang now. But here it goes, the universe bang, and here it starts. From nothing, there is now something, and that something has been expanding and going out and out and out for all these, how many years has it been going out? What is fascinating, and I, it was a shock, it'll be in my next uh, uh, editorial in the International News, was an astronomer who wrote a very interesting and a very lucid article on the subject that says basically science has come to agree with theology on this point. He didn't say they would agree with theology. He said they had come to a conclusion, and that conclusion agrees with theology. That before the Big Bang, there was nothing. Nothing. That even science says that the universe came into being from nothing. And it's been expanding ever since. Now, when you go out into the night sky and you look up above you, and I think at this time of year we begin to see the Milky Way again, or if we haven't, we begin to shortly, and we realize that we are, our, our planet sits out here around a, a third-class star way out on the edges of our galaxy, and that this we're rotating, our Earth is spinning on its axis, and our Earth is going around and around the sun, and the sun and one of the arms of a spiral galaxy is itself going around. And in our galaxy, this little spiral galaxy of ours, there are hundreds of billions of stars. Now, you may think you understand that, but you're probably you know, you know, not being entirely honest with yourself to try to grapple with the idea of hundreds, not just a billion, but billions, and hundreds of billions of stars. That our universe is, our galaxy, I should say, is 100,000 light years in distance from edge to edge. Oh, well, 100,000, that's, that's a number I can deal with, right? Well. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. It's eight minutes at the speed of light from the sun to the earth, which is the direction most light goes from the sun back to the earth. Eight minutes at 186,000 miles per second. A light year is the distance light travels traveling at 186,000 miles per second. You've got to multiply that by 60 to get the hour, by 24 to get to the days, and by 365 to get to the year as to how far light travels in one year. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years from edge to edge. Now add the fact that there are billions of galaxies and that the, the you know, an enormous number, in fact, I would say, venture to say most of the, of, the, of the objects that you're going to see in the night nice sky are, that you think are stars are not. So many of them are galaxies composed of billions of stars. Now. What got me about this one day was I was studying all this, and they finally have convinced me that this is true. All this happened, all this came into existence out of nothing, something close to 18 billion years ago. And they're able now, I think, to collect light in telescopes from objects that are something like 15 billion light years away. In other words, what they are seeing in the telescope, or what you see on the little picture that they may take through the telescope, is, is, is light that actually originated 15 billion years ago. <coughs> now, with all this in mind, and this is what, what, what was provo provocative to me when I suddenly considered it, with all this space, with all these stars, with all these galaxies and superclusters of galaxies, with all of these worlds that could be out there, <clears throat> and everybody's you know, trying desperately to determine, are there any other planets out there? And any fool with half a brain should know, sure, there are planets out there. There are going to be planets out there in their, in, in, their, in their billions, trillions, and so forth. Of course there are going to be planets out there. Now, how old is God? I asked the question somewhat or tongue-in-cheek in a sermon I gave some time ago. He's older than the universe, for he spoke the word and created the universe. What do you suppose that God has been doing for the last, oh, say, 15 billion years? Well, now, for some of that time, he may have been waiting for things to cool down a little bit, I suppose. 
What was he doing, though, for the last, say, 10 billion years or so, or the last 8 billion years? What has he been doing? Nothing. Thinking, perhaps. Sleeping, maybe. Eating, that's a possibility. What's God been doing? Well, as one pagan would ask the question, well, perhaps your God has gone hunting. Maybe God's been hunting. Ah, where has he been hunting? But the question, the question I could not escape as I began to think about it, is this. This world, this planet, this people, is this the first time God has ever done this? We have no way of knowing. But when you understand the mind, when you understand the incredible intelligence, when you understand the way in which the mind works, it's an important question. <clears throat> Is this the first time God has done it? And for you and me, maybe more of more interest is, will it be the last time he ever does it? <clears throat> Writing to the Romans, Paul made a very important statement. It's in the first chapter of Romans, and I'll begin reading in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven <coughs> excuse me, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. What can I know about the power and the mind of God from simply stepping outside and looking around me in the afternoon, going out again after dark on a clear night and looking around me once again? What can I know about the power of God and about the mind of God from what I see? Well, I can only make guesses in the direction of the power of God, but I do know some things. I do know that he is a designer, an incredible designer, for no matter how I look, no matter how carefully I look, and in fact the more closely I look, all I find everywhere I look is evidence of a designer, someone who thought it out, carefully thought it out, planned it out, worked it out, designed all of this. I find that he is an artist, an artist of consummate skill with an eye for beauty. I find him having enormous power. I find that God is ageless. I find that God works and takes pleasure in his work. Now, I can learn that from reading the pages of the Bible, but I can also come to that same conclusion when I sit out in my boat on some evening as the sun is going down over the horizon and I contemplate what I see, what I smell, what I hear, what I experience on every side, I can know that God works, and I can also know that he takes pleasure in his work. When he is finished, when God's work is finished, for, you know, you have to kind of figure that by the time we get through the next few years of this earth, when we get through kind of breaking everything apart, getting everything broke, and as many people killed as we can possibly kill, and Christ comes back and stops it all, and establishes his kingdom, we know that kingdom is going to go on for 1,000 years. Then we know there's another resurrection and a, a period of time after that when more people will be saved. And then we get out the other side of that, and we know the earth melts with a fervent heat. There's a new heaven, a new earth. Jerusalem comes down as a bride adorned for us. But here you've got the, a new city, a new Jerusalem, new earth and everything, and we're all there walking around on streets of gold. What is God going to do after that? Is that when we all finally get to retire? Is that when he, he decides to put up his feet? Is that when he decides to... But wait a minute. Some of you folks here are retired. Do you just do nothing? Those of you who are looking forward to retiring, are you looking forward to doing nothing? Or are you looking forward maybe to doing something else? I want to be, I want to retire, I want to get through with my business because I've got some other things I would like to do. Generally speaking, I hear that people who wind up thinking they're going to do nothing 
when they retire, often just die. And that is, of course, doing nothing. The people, on the other hand, who have other things they want to do, oftentimes start a second life, a second career, after they have retired. But can you imagine God retiring? Why? Because he's tired? Why? Worn out? Just, just fed up with it all? Doesn't want to do it anymore? I've done my time. It's time for somebody else to take over now. Or is God more like energetic, if that's a word you could possibly apply to God, aggressive, eager, anxious to do, with more plans, more ideas, more things to do than, than he has even let us know possibly exist at the present time? I don't know. I can sure tell you one thing. God has no intention of retiring. Now, you know, going back for a moment to that teen funeral, I didn't tell you something about that funeral. This fellow was telling us about this boy who had, was up in heaven driving fast cars and playing on loud stereos uh, up in heaven. That boy was drunk the day he died. He had been in several fights with his mother and with friends over the question of his drinking over a period of time in particular on this day. He had yelled at his mother, and his mother had tried to talk to him about his problem. He had gone to another room and gotten his father's shotgun, had threatened his mother with the shotgun, and then shot his best friend who was in the house with it, turned the gun on himself, and killed himself. His friends survived uh, the ordeal. Naturally, he did not. This kid is going to be the, the result of what he's done, the way he's lived his life. All the teenagers, they all believe that, right? That he's going to be up in heaven driving fast cars and playing on loud stereos. No, I don't think so. In fact, none of them seemed the least bit encouraged after that funeral was over if their reactions to one another and, 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 and the way in which they were weeping and, and crying, if it was any indication, they took no comfort from it at all. Now, I can tell you something. I can tell you that God is not through with this boy. But I can also tell you that fast cars and loud stereos are not in his future. What is? Maybe more important, what is in your future? I think that what may be in your future is what I'm going to call today, for want of a better term, a New World Workshop. There'll be a time when the kingdom of God is established upon earth, when God himself, when Christ himself, is going to call a group of us together. He's going to give us a job description. He's going to give us a territory. He's going to say, here are some things that have to be done. Now, how are you going to do it? And we're going to look at him and say... What do you mean, how are we going to do it? How do you want it done? And the great shock of our lives is going to come back when he says, it's not a question of how I want it done. I want to know, what are you going to do about it? You're the ruler of this city. How are you going to handle it? What are you going to do first? For if you think that we can come up out of the resurrection fully qualified for Jesus to walk up and, 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 and tap on us with his little magic wand and say, Presto, you are qualified to rule over ten cities without any training, knowledge, supervision, guidance, direction, learning, knowledge, then you are sadly mistaken. There's an enormous, complicated, difficult job to be done, and everything I read in the Bible says that you and I are going to have to be the ones who actually do it. Oh, we'll have help, guidance, and all those things. And so we'll go to work, and we will carry on that job. But I suspect that after that, better than a thousand years after that. In fact, a little bit beyond it to the point of where time doesn't matter anymore, we'll sit down in another New World workshop. And God or Jesus Christ or whoever it is that's talking to us will say, I have called you together because we have a job to do. There is this planet that is out toward the edge of galaxy uh, 3858 over in this quadrant. There is a planet around a small star, it's, a, it's the third planet out, and it's about right position, and it's been there long enough. It's time for us to do some work on this planet. Now, what we're going to do is we want some suggestions and ideas as to how we're going to populate it, who we're going to put on it, what we're kind of creatures we're going to put on it, and we're going to create here a world, a world based upon this planet's distance from its star, upon its mass upon what kind of creatures can survive upon his mass, whether we can have water or whether we will do without water, 
What are you going to do about this? Now, there is one other problem I want to tell you about before you go your way and start designing anything. As your world develops, some fool is going to come along and claim that it just evolved. That it just happened. Just kind of worked out that way. Your job is to design this in such a way that he can never get away with that. You cannot use the duck bill platypus that has already been done. We want a new approach. We want some new ideas. We want you not merely to repeat what has been done before, but to create. Captain Kirk and the Starship Enterprise will be here in not that many years hence, and we want you to have some surprises for him when he arrives, for those of you who follow the Star Trek series. There is a God in the universe who, by all accounts, loves to work. And whether you like it or not, you are a part of that work. He plans to have a lot of fun with you before it is all over. But here's the good news. It is never going to be over. Believe it or not, when I was a boy, I thought a lot about eternity. I guess it was because during part of this time I lived across the street from the church, and because it was so easy, my mother and dad sent me to Sunday school, and they sent me to church. And so I was in church a lot. And I heard a lot of preachers preach about eternity and about heaven and about hell, and about how long eternity was. Oh, I've, I've heard some dandies about how long eternity would actually go on. I worried a little bit about hell, but I never could really get my mind around the idea of a God who would burn me forever and ever, because after all, I was a good kid, you know, as kids go. So that didn't worry me all that much. You know what worried me? Missing out. Not being there. I remember one night in bed, sitting there trying to imagine eternity, and trying to imagine what it would be like for me to be dead, gone. No knowledge, no consciousness, no awareness of anything that was happening, and that there was a world going on. There were people out there having an absolute blast. People out there having good times. People enjoying all the things that I love and enjoyed and wanted to do and hoped to do. And where's old Ron? He's dead. And he'll never live again, and he'll never know any of that. I tell you, folks, that created a small, cold fear inside of me that hell never did. What do you have to do? And this is the question. What do you have to do to not miss out, to be sure you're there, to be sure you're a part of this New World Workshop whenever one of them starts, that you're there to put your two bits worth in, to make your suggestions, to come up with your ideas, and for somebody to say, hey, that's not a bad idea. Hey, why don't you get to work on that and get back to me in a couple of days with, with the way in which we can actually implement this. Something that's enjoyable, interesting, problems to solve, solutions to arrive at, good to be done, things to make you feel great. What do you have to do to be sure that you don't miss out on any of that? Well, there are a lot of things to think about, but I'll tell you one th place to start, and that is to study about God and to think about God. You study by simply reading what people have said about him in old, from old in the pages of the Bible. And you think about him by being out on your own at night or lying in bed at night or being out in some afternoon, some quiet spot when you're looking at the creation. And you think about God and you think about, why did he do this? Why did he put me here? Why has he created a situation so that this unique, one-of-a-kind person, nobody else has my finger, fingerprints, nobody else has my face, nobody else has my thoughts and feelings and the way I am. Why, why am I here? Why would God want me to be here? What would God ever want from me? Think about God. Learn what God has said to man and why. And of course, the most important thing that God ever gave to man was his law. Now, law is important not for the reasons that are often attributed to it. Law is not arbitrary. Law wasn't created because, let's see, uh, let's see now, this w thing here would be a whole lot of fun. Let's pass a law against that because it's too much fun. That's not what the law is about. The law of God is a purely, it is a purely revelatory device. It is there purely to reveal to you what works 
and what doesn't work relative to what God is doing and, 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 and living your life on God's world and God's planet and the things that God is doing. It isn't here because God didn't want you to have a good time. It isn't here because God just wanted to, you know, God, everybody's got to have some laws. Let's see. Let's give them some laws. Let's make this wrong and that wrong and the other thing wrong. It wouldn't be wrong unless I made it wrong, so I'll make it wrong. Nothing of the kind. The law is given to reveal to man what it is that doesn't work. Two aspects of the law. One is what doesn't work and what does work. And the other aspect of the law, which is extremely important, is what people oftentimes are fond of calling ceremonial or ritualistic that has to do with the way in which you go about worshiping God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to keep the holy days of God. The different laws that God gave them, many people think are not very important. They're very important for this reason. They keep you in the knowledge of the true God, who he is, what he is doing, and why he is doing it. And the most important thing in the world for you to do is to play out your role in God's work. In other words, if God says, do this, then you play out your role and you do it. God says, don't do that. You play out your role and you don't do it. That you play out your game of life according to the rules and the instructions and so forth that God has laid down for you. And you do it, and you keep doing it, and you wait for the real fun to begin. It won't be long.